Welcome back to another episode and another season of Sean and Ed's Do Baseball. I'm Sean. And I'm Ed's. And we are bringing you baseball history in 2024. That's right. Baseball history in 2024 on our bi-weekly baseball history podcast, where the story catcher doesn't know what the story pitcher is going to be on the mound throwing them. And I have quite the knuckleball for you today. You are starting the season again with a knuckleball like you did last year. Well, you had donkey baseball to start the season last year, which was amazing. I you do. stole that episode from my repertoire, but yeah, but well. uh, I'm glad you did because you, you you know you you did it probably more thoroughly than I would have. Well, this season's going to start off uh, a little bit more serious than donkey <laughs> okay. baseball. But before we start, uh, where can people find us on the internet? You can find us on Twitter at Doing Baseball and on Instagram at Doing Dot Baseball and on TikTok at Doing Dot Baseball. And I have a personal Twitter X dot com machine thing at uh, Ed's Do Baseball. And I'm at Sean Do Baseball, and that's Sean S-E-A-N, but you're listening to the podcast, so you can see that on <laughs> yeah, the You title. probably knew that already, but <laughs> thanks for clarifying. <laughs> thanks for clarifying. We also have a sponsor. Did uh, you know that Sean also mean, is apparently John, just as a side note, yeah. Sure. Anyway. Great. Yeah. Let's talk about our name. Yeah, let's talk about the entomology of our names. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's a three-letter word. Three-letter word. Three-dollar word. Yeah. Uh, but we have a sponsor. Uh, and speaking of our sponsor, Two Lewins Brewing. Uh, very excited. They're almost there, folks. They almost got a brick-and-mortar location. But you can buy their beer, their IPA, and their lager at uh, LCBO locations around Ontario, as well at your, as at your local bar. And, uh, yeah, look out for them. Buy their beer. Great beer. And, uh... uh as always, please be of legal drinking age and enjoy responsibly. Yeah. So I also want to give a shout out, Edzy, uh, to a buddy of mine uh, and uh, Joe Pernice of the uh, Pernice Brothers. They have a new album coming out on New West Records and you can stream their title track, Who Will You Believe Now? Uh, I believe on Spotify or wherever else. Check him out. Joe is, uh, uh, we used to coach together actually. And oh. He is really excited because one of our guys is uh, got a got a got a spot on a D1 team. So uh, I just wanted to give Joe a shout out there. Pernice Brothers, great band, dating back to the '90s, Sub Pop days. And uh, Joe's a big baseball guy, originally from Boston. So uh, oh. check it out. Well, that's great. Two uh, two coaches who are both musicians, and obviously Joe is a much better one than you. Oh so. my god. <laughs> Tons, tons. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just a little dig there. Sorry, Sean. Oh, all good. So you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, the unofficial fifth season of Sean Ned's Do Baseball with a question for you, Edzie. Okay. What do you know about the KBO? The Korean Baseball Organization? That's right. Uh, not very much, other than that's what that acronym stood for. There you go. <laughs> I know. Wait, hold on. Is it Korea... The Korean League, where if you win, you win a big sword. Uh, sure. I think, I'm pretty sure it's it's the Korean League. If if you win the champ, the trophy is a giant sword. Wow, I wish. Which is badass. I wish I'd looked that up. We can look that up as the episode goes on. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, we're going to talk about the KBO today, Edzy. Okay. And the history behind the KBO, more importantly, which I think you might find... Very interesting. All right. So on March 27th, 1982, the Korean Baseball Organization was launched. Oh, okay. More recently than I expected. Yeah. And we've mentioned, we've discussed the formation of leagues before on this podcast, Edzy. Mm -hmm. But what if I were to tell you that the KBO, one of the biggest professional baseball leagues in the world, was launched by a dictator to placate his subjects and divert the public's attention from politics to sports. Okay, I wouldn't be that surprised, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> you know, they, well, they say that uh, sports is the opiate for the masses, Sean. <laughs> I think that was religion, but as you'll see... 
Yes. Was it? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but no, you're right. 100% dictators throughout time and, and strongmen, authoritarians or whatever, have always used sports uh, as, as kind of a way to distract the public. Okay. Uh, and this league was just formed uh, as a, <laughs> this league was just formed by a big evil plan to destabilize the movement towards democracy in South Korea. All right. <laughs> I, I don't like where this is going. So Korean history runs deep. Uh, Korean baseball history runs deep and its connection to baseball is longer than most people would have probably expected. The introduction of baseball to Korea uh, is generally credited to Philip L. Gillette, a YMCA missionary who apparently was as keen to spread baseball as much as Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Did it by singing the Macho Man. <laughs> <laughs> so he forms uh, the, the first Korean baseball team in 1905, although... Uh, it was the first organized team. There's documentation of games being played in Korea as far back as 1894. Okay. So, so long time between the formation of the league. Yeah. 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 Because we're talking the KBO. Yeah. As so I, I was said. surprised that it had took so long. But have you said? Have you? There's a sinister reason. Obviously. Have you found the sword trophy? I did find the sword trophy. Do was you want to see it? KBO. It was. Oh. Great. Here's uh, the dinos celebrating last year. That's fucking amazing. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll put that up, and uh, that'll probably be our picture for the episode. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, unfortunately, uh, for most Koreans, most Koreans, uh, Imperial Japan would control the country from 1910 to 1945, a time period where, as we know from the Iji Sawamura episode, baseball was flourishing in Japanese culture. Mm-hmm. In December 1921, uh, American uh, Major League, uh, a team of Mar- Major League players stopped in Seoul during a tour of Asia, and a Korean team was assembled to play against them. Guess the score. Uh, 42 to 7. Yeah, it was a little bit closer than that. It was 23 to 3. Okay. For the Americans, of course. Right. So various Korean cities would participate in the Japanese inner city baseball tournament from its inception in 1927. And in fact, Seoul would win the tournament in 1940 and 1942, def- defeating Dalian and Osaka in the finals. Oh, nice. So they're starting to get, like, they're getting competitive there. Yeah. Finding, finding some parody. Yeah. And they're... But this is so. So this is uh, Japan holds like a yes. tournament every year. Yeah, yeah. It was like the the you know I guess every city puts their the team best forward. team forward. Yeah, and uh, you know eventually they won this tournament a couple years. Okay. Uh, a few years after that, of course, though, uh, Imperial Japan is defeated in World War II. The Korea region, which was part of Japan's territory, was occupied by American and Soviet forces. Under this, Korea was divided into two occupation zones, with the United States administrating the southern half of the peninsula and the Soviet Union administrating the north above the 38th parallel. Okay. So the two sides then worked, and I put it in quotes, to decide on who would run the new unified Korean government. But tensions rose between the U.S. and the USSR, as well as between the North and the South. Tensions eventually turned hostile, and in May 1946, very shortly after the war is over, it was made illegal to cross the 38th parallel without a permit. So the U.S. and the the Russians essentially cut it in two. Right. Um, 1948 now, with the end of the U.S. military government... South Korea declared its independence from Japan as the Republic of Korea. The North would follow suit a few weeks later and declared their own independence. So Korea is now two separate separate states. Yeah. But both states think that the other side belonged to them. Okay. That's key, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. The, The border between the two Koreas then, as you could guess, became quite hostile. Both the North and the South were very militaristically aggressive 
uh, to the point where <laughs> one of my favorite parts of Korean War history is that the U.S. essentially had to take the keys away from the South. It's like metaphorical, like war car. <laughs> They're like, oh, you're going to invade the North if we don't stop you. So like, yeah, yeah you don't get our help if you do that. Um, but then the North invaded the South. So... So they're like, ah, fuck, we gotta help you now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's one of my favorites. Everybody's like, yeah, the North invaded the South. And it's like, if the U.S. had, there was very likely that the South would have invaded the North. Yes. Um, so, but so, the, so what you're kind of saying is the, the Korean War was inevitable. Yeah, because of the Cold War politics between yes. the, the, the Soviets and the U.S. Yeah. Uh, the North in, invaded the South and the Korean War started, and it lasted till an armistice in 1953. Uh, and for more on the Korean War, I have written, Ask Ted Williams or Listen to Blowback. <laughs> Okay. So listen to Blowback, because you can't ask Ted Williams yet. <laughs> yet. Yet. <laughs> well, Blowback's a great podcast. They do a whole uh, episode on uh, the Korean War. Very great. Uh, or episode. Season. Anyways, now, the irony many people forget about the Korean War is that it, it's generally framed, and you went to school in, in Canada, and, you know, generally we, we learn most of the same things as the U.S., but... Y- the war is generally framed as like communist totalitarianism versus capitalist democracy, right? Uh-huh. The South is the democracy and the North is the, the... Yeah, as a lot of the conflicts of that era were. Yes, exactly. That's how it was framed, at least. Right. And, but there's, as we know about most things, there's much more nuance to every conflict. Yeah, and, and if you look at it now, you definitely see a, a flourishing South and a very totalitarian, despotic uh, North. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to believe uh, that the post-war South ended up uh, with democracy and capitalism. Yeah. But really, they just ended up with capitalism. Okay. So the first president, I Syngman Rhee... This. Yeah. As most people probably don't. When I tried to explain this episode to my mom, she was like, no, no, you mean North Korea. I'm like, no, <laughs> they don't let baseball happen in North Korea at all. This is how all happened in the South. Uh, the first president after the war, uh, Syngman Rhee, uh, he pushed through an amendment to exempt himself from uh, the eight-year term limit. He would be reelected in 1956, but soon after Rhee's administration arrested members of the opposing party and executed the leader after accusing him of being a North Korean spy. So not great for democracy that the, the president's just arresting all his political rivals and shooting them. Yeah. Um, Rhee would then openly rig uh, the 1960 election and murder students that dared protest irregularities in the vote. Oh, Jesus. The murder of students caused more protests and upheaval, and Rhee was finally forced to resign. Great, right? So everything okay. seems to be like, okay, we got that guy. Yeah, they got that guy out of there. Yeah, um, but uh, un- unfortunately, there's new parliamentary elections that were held in July 1960. Uh, the Democratic Party, which had been in opposition during the First Republic under Re, uh, easily gained power, and the Second Republic was established. The democratically elected government carried out a series of purges of military and police officials who had been involved in the anti-democratic activities or corruption under Re. So more than 2,200 government officials and 4,000 police officers were purged. So that's good. Yeah, it sounds sounds good. But for the ruling elites, that and the fact that relations with the North were now becoming better was not good. Okay. So in a year later, 1961, a group of army officers seized power in a coup. Okay, I was going to say, so you got like a little... Yeah, Civil War-ish kind of thing going brewing a little bit. Well, basically, Major General Park uh, Chung-hee, after serving two years as chairman of the military junta, he's like, yeah, we're just going to do away with most of these things, democracy and whatnot. But he's like, I will, like, do elections. And once again, he just, like, rigs the election and persecutes, (laughs) you know, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, Um, we saw that coming. Yeah. So he would rule for 17 years, and although there were elections, Park got more and more authoritarian. In 1972, he declared martial law, then introduced a highly authoritarian Yushin Constitution, which gives the president the authority to rule with an iron fish and began... An iron fish? An iron fish. (laughs) 
an iron fist and uh, began officially ruling as a dictator. So it was like, okay. yeah, we're just like, well, that election thing was fun, but yeah, it's much easier this way yeah. for me. So he, and the elections will come back at the Leo here. Okay. He, he constantly uh, repressed political opposition and dissent. And he completely controlled the military as well as the media and arts. So very, very much just completely in control. But shit is not great at this time. He starts drinking as well. There is a lot of stuff. And this is really fucked up. But his own KCIA intelligence chief murders him on October 18th, 1979. Okay, what a twist. Yeah, they just get into an argument over policy and whether it was planned or not. I don't think it was planned, but he just, the, the KCIA's guy's like, you're fucked. Like, you're fucked. You know what? Just, bah, just shoots him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. They were just drunk on rice wine. Probably. And, yeah. Probably. I was not saying on the rice wine. I'm just saying drunk, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, like, he woke up the next day like, oh, no, I killed the dictator. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm hungover. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in May 1980... A massive uh, democratization movement occurred across the country because all the people were like, oh, that guy's dead. <laughs> yeah, let's jump on this. Now's the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In Seoul, uh, demonstrations grew into what was called the Seoul Spring. However, the Korean people's desire for democracy would not prevail. A new military junta would seize power under Chun Du Hwan. And he responded to the democracy demonstrations by expanding the emergency, uh, the emergency martial law. So just me like, like no, nah, nobody's allowed to do anything. Military's in charge. Okay. The expansion, uh, he closed all the universities, bland, banned, bland, banned political activities, and further subdued the press and media. So he's just coming in. He's putting a stranglehold on yeah. everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the KCIA, whose head had shot and killed the former president, Park Chung-hee, raided and arrested the student leaders of 55 universities and over, uh, with over 2,500 other political opponents. So they basically just, once again, get into power and purge all the democracy movements and political opposition. Okay. And this is where she gets real bad. In the city of... <laughs> As if it's not bad enough. <laughs> In the city of... It's all leads to two, baseball. We've had two coups so far. <laughs> okay. We're getting to the baseball. <laughs> yeah. So in the city of Guangzhou, pro-democracy protesters resisted and state security forces responded with a brutal crackdown that lasted for 10 days, during which hundreds of people were arrested, tortured, and or murdered. Oh, that sounds sounds not very good. Yeah. On May 18th uh, in Guangzhou, uh, uh, they tussled with airborne troops blocking the university entrance and then began a sitting uh, for the cancellation of martial law. This is the students, of course. The troops mm -hmm. responded with force and went into an orgy of violence throughout the city, beating any your youth or any citizen who dared come to their aid. The violence grew as students fought back with rocks, but the soldiers began using their bayonets to attack and kill well, the students. Yeah. Kind of indiscriminately, you know, just anybody that was like 25 or younger. Mm -hmm. If you were mm -hmm. like caught out on the street, they were like pulling people off of, out of buses and just like killing them. And then like a bus driver's trying to help. And then they kill the bus driver. Oh like, my God. Like, yeah. Yeah. So. So like, as, as you were mentioning, like, you know, this is the democratic state. Yeah, this is South Korea. Yeah. This is South Korea in, in 1980. Uh, so on May 20th, okay. the paratroopers and police now started opening fire on protesters outside the train station. Citizens burned down the local news station, claiming it was spreading government lies and killed four police officers. That night, taxi drivers led uh, drivers for democracy protest. Uh, they were tear gassed, beaten, and shot. Damn. It's only 40 years ago? Yeah. Shit. Yeah. So, of course, all this just leads to more protests. Like, the whole city's uprising against the government. Mm -hmm. On May 21st now, violence reached its peak, and paratroopers fired into a crowd, killing hundreds of people. Holy fuck. Um, the people of Guangzhou began to arm themselves and push the government forces outside the town and seal off the city. Uh, but the government 
basically, you know, surrounded the city and they killed anybody trying to like escape essentially Good so god yeah, yeah there's like people that like swam across rivers and they just like shoot at them and kill them and then they drown or die of their wounds yeah. uh in the end uh man. about one to two thousand people died with two thousand to thirty five hundred wounded chun's government of course at the time said only 144 civilians had died and anyone who wanted to dispute that was liable for to, for arrest for spreading rumors it was only 144 and if you wanted to speed it we can make it 145 real quick that is the appropriate amount of people to kill in this situation yes, yes. <laughs> fuck me so to top it all off uh on on the 17th of october chun abolished all political parties and uh, it's just me now yep 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 uh so Oh, God, it keeps going. I keep thinking we're getting to baseball. Also, uh, in, in 1980, he uh, opened the Sam Chung re-education camp. Uh, and I go, beginning in, 19, in August 1980. It's never actually re-education. <laughs> it's not. It's just my education. <laughs> yeah. I want for you. So citizens were subjected to organized violence under the name of social cleansing, which aimed at the elimination of social ills, such as violence, smuggling, illegal drugs, and deceptions. They were, Deceptions. They were arrested without proper warrants and given ex-party rankings. Some 42,000 victims were enrolled in the Sam Chung re-education camp for purifica- purificatory education. They're purifying the Betsy. Oh, my God. More than 60,000 people were arrested in six months between August 1980 and January 1981, including many innocent civilians. They faced violence and hard labor in the re-education camps. So that's where we're at, Hedzie. That's so crazy. Like, let's just... I I don't really... I mean, other than, like, it's just a bunch of people who want the power of the country. Yeah. And, like, all the civilians of the country are just, like, you know, being victimized by, like, these power struggles. You know, because... Because of the the stamping out of dissent. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. And the, and it's all being backed by the U.S. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're okay. They're like, hey, we don't want we don't want the North to expand. <laughs> so like, that? here's some money. Yeah. Do with it what you will. Yeah. And they're just you know while keeping the North at bay, they're also yeah you know stepping on the throat of their own people yeah jimmy carter or whatever whoever was in charge uh, during the guanje or guanju massacre was just like hey don't do that mm-hmm. we don't do that but there's no other consequences than that um so the regime is is trying its best to ease tension and introduce the minor reforms uh, like easing evening curfews, and this is the best, Edzie, abolishing haircut regulations. So oh, you can get your haircut again. <laughs> oh, no, however or, you want now. Oh, you can have longer hair now. Or whatever you want. The government won't tell you how to cut your hair now. No sideburns, though, Mattingly. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. So democracy, you get hair. Yeah. You don't get to vote, but you get yeah. a haircut. What was the other one? Uh, that that uh, easing of evening curfews. Oh, okay. You can right, stay the, out till eight thirty now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so pre- President Dad is 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 allowing you a little more freedom. Uh, uh, is uh, that that is that like that's his name, Dad? No. no. Oh, okay. I've said his name like three times. Anyways, I'll say it again. So uh, I thought there was maybe a new guy. No, There's been a new no, fucking guy every no. every five months. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> I was going through about 30 years of history in, in 20 minutes. So, I know. I know but uh, in a presidential secretary uh, meeting in May 1981, just after the inauguration of the Fifth Republic of Korea, the creation of professional sports was discussed with an intention to deflect the negative views of the military regime. All right. Well, let's distract them with some ball. Yeah. Four months later, in September 1981, uh, the military... Junta government would win the bid for the 1988 Summer Olympics. Oh, fuck yeah. We might as well go there. It seems like a great place. Yeah. There's no political unrest <laughs> going on. Yeah. These guys are great. Yeah. Uh, It'll be settled down by 88. By the time we get there, yeah. it's, you know, how long ahead is this? Six years? Yeah, about eight. 
Okay, it's still the 1980? 1981. That's true. I guess they do too. It doesn't matter. Anyway, Either way. Um, so this was all part of the government's attempt to legitimize itself globally, uh, which, as I say, sadly worked. Everybody's like, yeah, these guys are great. It's a yeah, minor and murder and torture yeah. and re-education camps. Yeah, look at the sports over here. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, there was the implementation of the 3S policy in Korea to dispel the public's get discontent with the now prolonged dictatorship. Three S's. Can you guess the three I S's? Was just you racking know my one. brain. You know one already. We've talked about sports. Oh, sport. Oh, okay. Sports. I don't know. What's Korea known for making? Sushi? Well, no, that's Japan. I know. You're <laughs> awful at this. <laughs> <laughs> TVs. Sanyo? Screens. Oh, screens. And what's oh, okay. the other the other S? Three letter word. Come on. The C. No. <laughs> Sex, sports, uh, and screen. Of course. That was their idea. They're like, if we get everyone a TV, a baseball With some team. sexy girls and a be- baseball team on there. We're good. With that, we'll, we'll, we could kill anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, look around. <laughs> yeah. that's our society now if nobody else is getting what I'm saying (laughs) Um, to to summarize gestures broadly yeah so to summarize all this I actually I I, I ended up reading basically a a piece by uh, this wonderful uh, Wan Chul Bing uh, and it it was called The Social Political Approach to the Launch of the KBO Leak Uh, and I quote from it now In 1982, all classes and generations of Korean people were under substantial pressure. Korea's society was on the edge of chaos as the people were engulfed by issues such as distrust in politics, political oppression, economic instability, democracy movements, and social unrest. Amid these situations, the Korean Baseball or Korean Professional Baseball League evolved. Okay. So that's not what a place to evolve from, but. (laughs) Yeah, you know, well, it sounds like it. I mean, it makes sense whether the reasoning is good or not, but but remember, I mentioned like all these guys have also really controlled media and the arts and stuff like that. Yeah, so you mentioned the that only earlier, way yeah. it would you know become more than what it was already, which we already talked about, is really popular still. It's still a really popular sport, but dating back, you know, at this point, like yeah, 75 years, they just years. didn't have their own league, yeah. they just had a tournament team. Well, they so so I'll tell you, the Korean Baseball Association was formed in 1946, and that governed the domestic and amateur competitions. So the national South Korean team and and the local you know semi pro leagues right, around. Right. The, I mean, even at that time, yeah. I mean, there was there was plane and travel yeah. to a certain extent at that time, but you know. All sport would still be much more localized in oh. like the forties, right? Especially in places like Japan and Korea. Yeah, you know. So as you mentioned, you know, things start modernizing, and and the net Korean national baseball team gets uh, much more notoriety. They actually win the Asian championship in uh, nineteen sixty three, and cr- people after that really try to organize baseball in Korea. Uh, and this included a Korean American businessman called Hong Yoon Hee, who formed the Korean professional baseball Promo- promotion committee in 1975 and donated $200,000 to promote the creation of a Korean professional baseball league. Okay. So this is not to say I'm just trying to caveat. It's not all because of the murder and the torture and stuff that we got Korean baseball. Right. But it had a lot to do with it because there was no way it was going to happen without the president mm-hmm. giving the green light. Yeah, they, and they took advantage of, like, sounds like they took advantage of, like, a grassroots movement that was already happening. Yeah. And they were like, okay, let's let's pump some money into this and that'll, you know, yeah. be one of the three S's. Yeah, and there was business baseball teams at this time across Korea, too. So you're right. Okay. So it's sort of in line. You know, Japan's yeah. like that sort yeah. of now. The teams are named after businesses. Well, and they still are. And and but at this time, you know, he this this Hong Yun he is persuading all these business elite guys to be like, hey, like, you know, your company baseball team should, you know, have better equipment and you know, train better. And you know, he's trying to push these guys to like, really get into 
pro baseball. Okay. Um, so baseball was popular uh, with the people, and Hung had been persisting Korea's elite to form a national pro league for almost half a decade now. With this popular and financial support already in place, baseball was the perfect way for the regime to distract its population from the suppression, murder, torture, camps, and everything else they were doing right now. Yeah. So the league was formed in just three months in the fall of Damn. 1981. Okay. Which is, you can, is like three or four months after they massacred this city. Yeah. Uh, the KBO would be officially founded on December 11th, 1981. There were six teams for the upcoming 1982 inaugural season. Samsung, Lot, NBC, OB, uh, High Tai, and Sammy. These teams were dispersed regionally, but... Un- Sammy's just a guy. <laughs> it's just, it's Sammy. Sammy's just some guy that... <laughs> it's S-A-M-M-I. It's just... And Sammy. Yeah. Hey. It's some guy that is rich. Started his own team among all these... I don't have a business. I'm just... Sammy. Anyway. Yeah. So unlike American teams, there were their names came from companies that owned them. Yeah, we already established this. South Korea had gone through a long period of hypercapitalization, which had helped create some of the big Korea's biggest companies, while the people in Korea consistently had seen their living standards regress since the war. So that's another thing that's it's pretty wild about Korean history is the North actually modernized way before the South in like terms of like from the 1950s through the 80s right uh, and, and then and, they just kind of paused yeah well korea south yeah. korea just kept going but there was huge huge wealth disparity at this time so the people that were able to basically get rich off the the military junta governments and stuff like that you know had big businesses but there was also a lot of desperate poor people at the time too okay um so uh yeah, and back to the social, social, socio political approach to the launch of the KBO by Won Chung Bill. Uh, Bing, uh, in 1982, President Chun Doo Won invited the owners of the professional baseball teams to a meeting and directly gave them detailed instructions about the expected performance levels of the baseball teams and, and Edzy, the cheering culture of the spectators. Oh, okay. So here's how you cheer. <laughs> as well as the future operation strategy for the KBO. He emphasized the need to promote the popularity of professional baseball nationwide by leveling off the performance of all teams and emphasizing regional representation. And he asked for the participation of local leaders to support the success of the KBO, as well as for the promotion of a cheering culture and the expansion of fandom. In particular, the president asked the professional baseball that professional baseball should play a role in the nation's development by providing pleasure to the people and promoting amenity with foreign countries. <laughs> so the president's Crazy. like directly like, yeah. here's how this goes, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not in the same way, but it sort of sounds like if you're like an Arizona Coyotes fan. <laughs> 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 yeah, like a because I've heard that there's like a you can you if you're a season ticket holder they have like a seminar before the season like <laughs> teach you how the game works oh, and yeah. how how to cheer when it's appropriate to cheer. This is how we cheer. <laughs> this is when we cheer. Yes. I mean it's not forced upon you. But. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 the president Chun is is directly using baseball as a means to gain popular support and international recognition. He literally wants to pit people against each other in the bleachers so they can't come together against him and protest his policies. Ah, right. Okay. So if we if we split them up by their baseball teams yeah. and they fight over the baseball season, yeah. they'll forget about everything. Well, else. and they'll be distracted, they'll be happy, they'll they they'll, they'll completely forget about yeah. the political they go worries. They're the emotional roller coaster of sport rather <laughs> than the roller coaster of life. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So uh, I I'll quote now from a uh, Jin Sun Kim, a PhD student uh, in the Department of Asian Studies at UBC. I quote, By creating a professional baseball league, the new regime sought to divert the public's attention from politics. Thus, rather than market demand, it was a strategy of political expediency implemented by the state officials that gave birth to the KBO. Okay. 
So this we've been kind of talking about, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of you know citing actual it. academics to prove right. my point that right. I'm not making this up. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, I, I uh, this had nothing to do with the people wanting baseball and everything to do with politics, even though they did want baseball. So the six teams in the league in the inaugural 80 game season was split into two with the winners of the first half facing each other in the Korean series. So there's a first half winner and a second half winner. They uh-huh. Uh-huh. The OB, uh, Oriental Brewing Bears, uh, would win the first half of the season with the Samsung Lions winning the second half. Uh, the first game of the season, I don't know why I put the winner of the event, was uh, the first game of the season took place as the Samsung Lions and the MBC Blue Dragons uh, played at Dong Daemon Stadium in Seoul. MBC or N? M. Oh, M. Okay. I heard N at first, and I was like, oh, like the network, yeah. the television network. Obviously so not. guess who threw out the first pitch at the first game of the KBO League in the eighties? No, it's the dictator. The, oh, of course. Well, the president. Of course. Yeah, he's like course. locked out. He was like, yeah. ah, I'm the president. Here's baseball. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The game was... I ra- invented this. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever played baseball yeah, before. <laughs> yeah. Write that down. Yeah. The game, uh, as I mentioned, between the Blue Dragons and the Lions was, was nuts uh, and as memorable as any inaugural game in baseball history. The Lions pulled ahead early, knocking MBC's pitcher out and taking a 5 to nothing lead after just an inning and, uh, and a half. But the Blue Dragons fought back uh, it, to make it 7-4, the Lions going into the seventh uh, with two runners on base in the bottom of the seventh. MBC's Yu Sung An hit a huge home run, giving the Seoul Club three runs to tie the game at seven. Coming back from a five nothing lead, pretty great. Okay. The team stayed tied in the tenth until the tenth, and with two outs, they loaded the bases for Lee Chong Du, who stepped up and hammered a walk-off Grand Slam for the home team. Walk-off Grand Slam, Steve Pierce style. Yeah. Nice. Imagine that first game ever of the KBO, extra What innings. a way to start. Yeah, you got a dictator throwing so out the first that was pitch. Samsung? Samsung was in that game? Yeah. And that, they lost? No, they won. Oh, they won. Okay. Yeah, I believe. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Samsung won. They were the home team. So now there are a few things different about uh, Korean baseball, uh, Edzie, that I should tell you about. Besides the sword trophy. Besides the sword trophy that I did not I think include that's new. This. I think that's a new thing. <laughs> I don't care. It's awesome. <laughs> anyway. There's a few other awesome things we're going to talk about now. Uh, there, there's there's ties. Oh, really? Yeah. So if a, a, I'm not sure if it's still, but if a game's not settled after 12 innings... Uh, it would be declared a tie game, uh, and that would extend to 15 in the playoffs. I don't know. You could still tie in the playoffs? That makes no sense. Oh, we'll talk about it a little bit. This would not happen all year until the Korean series. Oh, really? Of all times. In the 1982 series, which we already kind of mentioned, uh, the series would feature the the, uh, Oriental Brewing Bears against the Samsung Lions. The Bears were led by Dong Joon Yoon at the plate, who had collected 97 hits in 77 games, including 33 extra base hits, good enough for a 960 OPS. Fuck, he's a superstar. He's a superstar, he's great. On the mound for the Bears, uh, they had a beast in Chiol Sun Pak, who had played uh, for the Mil- Milwaukee Brewers uh, minor league organization in 1980 and 1981. Uh, but mostly mm. for their A-ball teams. He had made it to double-A El Paso for 11 games in 81, but posted a dismal uh, 577 ERA in 53 innings pitched. That's, uh, uh, I mean, Maybe I'm showing my ignorance a bit here, but that's got to be one of the like early oh. Asian players in the major league system, no? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple guys that, 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 yeah, but nobody gets to the major leagues. We'll talk about the first Korean to get to the major leagues. We're, okay. we're getting there. But okay. this is one of the guys that got close, like double A, right? Pretty pretty close. But he fizzled yeah. out at double A. It's rare for this to happen at this time. So this guy is a superstar just because he made it to the minor leagues in America. And now he's coming back for the first year of the KBO. He puts up a 1.84 ERA with 15 complete games and a 24 and 4 record. 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, not surprising. Like you say, like if he was the only guy to go to America. Well, and one even, of the only guys. Or one for of sure. the few guys to go to America. Yeah. You know, and even though he, as you say, you know, for lack of a better term, fizzled out at before Double making a. it to the majors, that's still, he'd be the best guy oh, yeah. coming back, right? Yeah. So the Lions were no slouch themselves. They were easily the most talented team when it came to uh, pitching, leading the league in ERA, whip, and strikeouts. And they had just four pitchers throw 693 of the team's 704 total innings pitched. Four pitchers. Like not, I'm not saying starters. I'm saying four pitchers, just four dudes all together. <laughs> yeah. Holy well, they, shit! Yes. How many innings? Six hundred and ninety-three. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, those four pitchers: uh, Guang Bong Huang, Young Ho Kwan, Sun He Lee, and Nak Su Song all posted ERAs between two point three seven and two point nine one. So not as good as the 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 Oriental Brewing's superstar, but. They just had a solid staff. I was going to say, it seems like across the board that that would be the most competitive yeah. staff. So, in the first ever Korea series, the Bears hammered the Lions pitching, and they walked away with the series. The first game, uh, the first <laughs> game actually in the series would end in a 3-3 tie. So the first game of the Korea <laughs> series is tied, uh, but then the Bears would take four out of the next five games to clinch the series, and, and it was over. So okay. it was a big success. Uh, many of Korea's best players, though, did not participate in the first KBO season. It was hastily thrown together by mm -hmm. the, the president and stuff, and there were also... Uh, so some, because they were like politics, they were like, oh, like... Life is hell right now. <laughs> you like uh, <laughs> the president wants all the baseball. Like okay, so some people yeah. definitely were against it for political reasons, but most didn't because Korea was hosting uh, the 1982 Amateur World Series. So if they played professional, they wouldn't be able to play for the oh okay the I got amateur you. team. So Korea would win the tournament, defeating Japan in Seoul, which only added fuel to the baseball crazy culture at the time. And now going into 1983, many of the national heroes from the Amateur World Series would join pro teams. So, okay, they so were you got an influx of talent coming in. Now. Yeah, you have you know 20, 25 of the best players that didn't play in the first year now coming into the the next year. Excuse me. And there's so, only but, six teams, so like yeah, you know yeah, that's that's going to get spread out and yeah. improve the league quite a bit so baseball looked to be doing exactly what chun du huan wanted it to do distracting and placating the people but in 1980 i mean i've already forgot about all the political <laughs> unrest <laughs> you're like that was that all sounded amazing yeah. <laughs> so it is backfires though as, as any dumbass you know authoritarian will not see coming so in 1983 the the uh, hatai tigers would win the korea series the tigers were from the same province as guanju the city that he massacred. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and not only would they win, they'd become the first dynasty. So the people of Guangzhou in that region hated him. Mm -hmm. And the best team in the country is from that area. Okay. So they not only are, you know, they're working in some, let's just say they're, they're using baseball. They're like, yeah, fuck you, president. We're the best. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's it's much, it's kind of backfiring. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, backfiring on who? On the president? On the president. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's bringing these people together and they're all, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, our baseball team's the best. You killed our people. Like, yeah. Go fuck yourself. Uh, so once again, I'm going to quote. I feel, I feel like, well, I mean, I don't know if the president doesn't necessarily care, but uh, I mean. Yeah, it's he he doesn't really, but it's just kind of interesting that the the cheering culture that he wanted to create has brought all these people together that, right. that hate him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I I see what you're saying. Like the team has like you know given everybody something to like rally around. Yeah. And you know now they're all together talking about their political descent. woes. Yeah, and descent. You know. So I'll quote from uh, Jin Sun Kim, uh, the, the PhD student again from US, U UBC. For the spectators of the, oh God, Chola provinces, 
Uh, baseball games were not just diversions, but outlets for their resentment against the government that forced victims into silence after the massacre. So they're like using baseball to like bring the massacre back to light. And I continue the quote, the people of Chola enthusiastically cheered for the high tide tigers, uh, who were eventually renamed the Kia tigers, the baseball team in the region, uh, to express their sorrow. So they're, they're, as I say, once again, this team became a dynasty, winning championship nine times between 1983 and 1997. These victories Damn. by Hatai uh, were seen as symbolic triumphs over Chun Duwan's regime, whose cabinet was largely comprised of ministers from the Kyonseng provinces. In this sense, the baseball stadium at Kwangju acted as a place for political resistance against the authorities. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. I like it. Very cool. So Chun's plan is backfiring a little bit uh, because now the best teams, you know, basically holding like anti-government rallies as like their the team te- wins the- championship after championship. Okay. <laughs> That's what I was kind of going to ask is like, so the team, because the team is like owned by a company. It's not like the the league is a con- uh you know, what do you call that? Like where they're all together, the the league owns every team, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the owners of, of the team are descendants as well. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like they're all like, you know, they've all been enriched by what's been happening over the last mm-hmm. little while. So it's, 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 they're all, but it's all very regional, right? So he's like fractured regionally and, and it gets worse because these regional Things get real bad uh, because so the Samsung Lions were from the Yongnam region, and we're talking about the the dynastic uh, Hatai Tigers uh, from the Hunam region. Now the former president Park Chung Hee, the dude that got killed by his own CIA dude, right? Um, he was he was from Yongnam and and basically did the same thing he like really oppressed this like one province yeah uh after securing the presidency back in the 70s so <laughs> basically these regional tensions did not just extend to the current presidency but to the last presidency and when the Hatai Tigers beat the Samsung Lions at home during the 1986 Korean series in response, a hundred Samsung Lions fans set the Hatai Tigers team bus on fire. Oh my god! <laughs> they fucking rioted because they were like, it was all political. Like I was the political say, it's t- crazy. <laughs> like these baseball teams are like extensions of like political parties based on like where they are. Yeah, you know. So people love baseball. It's a rousing success, but the domestic politics that Chun had wanted to get away from was are not now, are now like somewhat integral to like the rivalries of these teams <laughs> yes <laughs> including a resistance against his own regime yeah um and so the people would not so you have like loyalist teams and and rebel teams essentially in a weird way to a certain extent yeah. yes so the good news is chun's regime would not last long uh and the people of korea would not forget his sins but that you'll hear later. It sucks. Anyways, Chun's regime uh, would not last long. I just said that. Chun's 1981 constitution, uh, which he enacted, restricted the president to a single seven-year term. Unlike his predecessors, though, Chun was unable to amend the document. It's in the order- weirdest <laughs> length of a term I've ever heard. Well, he's and he's unable to amend the document to run again after 1987, which is just, you know, it's what dictators do. They're like, hey, you know, like, I'll only be in power for like seven years. And then they'll find a reason and be like, oh, turns out it's going to be 20. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but he's trying to do this, but he can't find a way legally to do this. And there's all this political pressure because nothing. Thing that he's tried has really helped it go away. So he he's basically screwed. He has to he has to, he can't run again after 1987. Um, but he he really wants to stay in control. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he he starts you know basically. Thus far closing. Uh, I gotta get back to this. The Constitution explicitly stated that any amendments extending. Uh, president's term would not apply to the incumbent, thus foreclosing any attempt to extend Chung's tenure short of adopting a new constitution. However, he consistently resisted pleas to open up the regime and hand-selected the man he wished to 
succeed him, no Xinjiang. So, okay. He's leaving, but he's picked his own dude to replace him. Yeah. On April 13th, 1987, Chun made the April 13th defense of the Constitution speech. He declared that the DJP candidate, which is political party for president, would be one of his military supporters, and his successor would be chosen as an in an indirect election similar to the one that elected Chung seven years earlier. He's like, we're going to have an election and you're going to vote for this guy. (laughs) The announcement enraged the democratization or the democracy community and in concert with several scandals and political unrest from the Chung government that year, demonstrators began their movement once again for democracy. Uh Uh-huh. In June 1987, a series of huge pro-democracy rallies across the country took place. On July 10th, 1987, Chun resigned as head as the, of the Democratic Justice Party. So he's gone. Okay. And uh, does that other guy take over? No. Okay. In December 1987, uh, presidential election... Ro Te Wu won the election with a plurality, the first free and fair election of any sort in the country in well over decades. Yeah, well, that's uh, good. Chun finished out his term and handed over the presidency to Ro on February 25th, 1988, the first peaceful transition of power in South Korea's history. I shouldn't say in South Korea's history, but, well, yeah, in South Korea's history, because if Mm -hmm. we're talking about the post-war South Korea, um, Chun's Democratic uh, Justice Party would lose their majority in the National Assembly with the ruling party in minority. Uh, A committee was formed to explore the events of Guangzhou. So they're going, they're like, hey, remember that city you massacred? We're going to look into that. We're going to look into that again. The democratization movement... uh, and where responsibility should lie for the massacre. On November 11th, 1988, Chun apologized to the nation in a public address, pledging to give his money and belongings back to the country. Because he had also been robbing the country blind. (laughs) Uh, Give your stuff back, I guess. (laughs) Don't kill me? (laughs) Chun resigned from both uh, the National Statesman Committee and the, the DJP party. Chun should have been giving his money back to the country after Kim Young Sam's inauguration as president of South Korea in 1993, Kim declared that Chun Doo-won and Ro Tae-woo had stolen 400 billion won from the Korean people. That's, that's about 380 or 370 million dollars. US. Yeah. That's, uh, a, that's a lot. So it's he was bit. going to conduct an internal investigation to prove this. So basically the dude's like, I'll give you all the money back. And they're like, Thanks for all the money back. Where's the rest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. It's, it's all, all there. And they're like, no, we'll prove it by yeah, you. Okay. So December 1995, Chun and 16 others were arrested on charges of conspiracy and insurrection. At the same time, an investigation into the corruption of their presidency has begun. In March 1996, Chun's trial began. On August 26, the Seoul District Court issued him a sentence of death. Okay. That's the worst sentence. Yes. Well, he killed a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. He gave us baseball, but you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Which uh, was good. Uh, Not a big death sentence guy, uh, but yeah, like we should kill this guy. Definitely (laughs) kill that guy. Um, Unfortunately, his sentence uh, would be commuted to life in prison. Mm -hmm. And very unfortunately, Ed Z outgoing president who i mentioned was elected in like 93 was the one that was like hey fuck you i've found more money uh kim young sam basically he let him go oh he was just like ah yeah never mind never mind you can you can do so he's still he's like ruined like chun was required to pay massive fines at the point uh, he had only paid, uh, uh, you know, he was he he had taken four hundred billion. He had taken he paid back fifty three point three billion, uh, you know, about a fourth of the fine. Uh, Chun made a relatively famous quote saying, "I only have two hundred ninety thousand won to my name." This, of course, was a lie, as a team of prosecutors, tax collectors, and other investigators raided multiple locations simultaneously uh, in July. 2013 now, including Chun's residence 
and his family members' homes and offices. Television footage showed him them hauling away paintings, porcelain, and expensive artifacts. See, remember when I said he was ruined? He yeah, was so they, not. <laughs> no, okay. So they came and took all his assets, though. Yep. Yep. Uh, among the properties searched were two warehouses owned by publisher Chun Jae-kwak, Chun's oldest son, which contained more than 350 pieces of art by famous Korean artists, some estimated to be worth 1 billion won. Holy shit. So he basically transferred a lot of his assets to his son and mm. his rest of his family to like get away Try with it. Was it, yeah. like, I only have like a couple thousand yeah. bucks. Like, you know, like where they're trying to like bleed me dry. Mm-hmm. It's like you should be dead, first of <laughs> yeah, all. <laughs> yeah. You're lucky to be alive. Yeah. So this piece of shit would go on to publish uh, memoirs where he lied about the massacre on top of other things and would be sued oh, for libel. <laughs> like, so you just, just lie. Like made these, <laughs> yeah. th- these are fiction books. And finally, this motherfucker would die at the age of 90 in 2021. Oh, man. So that's... That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I just... That, I, I hate that guy. Um, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. <laughs> just, yeah, just straight up, I hate that guy. So back to the KBO. Um, and to quote again from uh, Wan Cho Bing uh, in his paper, the KBO League started as a tool to endorse a military coup government through a symbolic manipulation. Over time, the League wandered away from the political handling and began developing a new culture. Which is basically when we get to like modern Korean baseball. And uh, the league would expand to eight teams in 1991. In 99, the uh, season expanded to 132 games. And the KBO separated into two divisions. Motherfucking Dream League and the Magic League. <laughs> That's <Edzie>. amazing names. <laughs> so distracting. I am so distracted. We won the Magic League! <laughs> No wonder it's a sword. Yeah, yeah. It sounds very like uh what's what's the fantastic. Like yeah. it's, you know, like I'm, a medieval league or some shit. Like yeah. like wizards and fucking yeah. knights battle. So since then uh they've added actually two more teams including the NC Dinos who who I'm pretty familiar with. That's uh, the champs. Yeah, and the KT Wiz in uh, 2015. Uh, now with 10 teams, the KBO has gone back to no divisions. Boo! Look, magic! Uh, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the teams play... Who decided that? That's yeah, a terrible decision. Terrible decision. Uh, I'm less te- distracted. Yes. The teams play against e- each opponent 16 times for an 144-game regular season schedule. Uh, the number of spectators has increased. The inaugural year, which we talked about, uh, was 1.4 million people. Uh, and in 2016, 8 million Koreans tuned in to watch wow. baseball. Wow. Uh, and the fans are crazy. Like, we talked about the government, like, really dictating how fans should cheer and, like, really regimenting, like, weird, like, dictatorial, mm-hmm. you know, rules. But the fans still, like, it's evolved to, like, the most fun fandom. And there's quotes from so many American players that I didn't include about just playing in Korea and being like, yeah, they, they cheer for everything they mm-hmm. have a cheer for a fucking bunt they it, have a it, cheer for, it's a, like for a, a double play they like you know i've only seen videos but it like seems uh similar i mean in england it's not it wasn't like you don't have to go to a clinic to learn how to cheer but i mean maybe there is actually but it's not mandatory yeah but yeah. you know like there's a song for every situation <laughs> yeah. at a soccer stadium you yeah. know yeah yeah it is much more it's much less passive of a time yes it is it is yeah. much more uh yeah and if you are a hardcore fan you are way more than than just a, a North American hardcore mm-hmm. fan. It sounds like it would be perfect for the gentleman that my girlfriend and I had the pleasure of yeah. sitting beside in Nashville. There you go. Who at the sounds? Who, yeah, at the sounds. Nice. Who referred to himself as Captain Extreme? Of course. Well, who else would you meet at a Nashville <laughs> soundscape? <laughs> anyway, so back shout to shout out to that guy. We're just gonna finish up here. Uh, the competition and quality of play in the KBO has gotten stronger and stronger. With that, Korea has also become a spawning ground for Major League Baseball stars, including the first Chan Ho Park. Mm, mm-hmm. Chan Ho Park uh, was a sophomore at Hanyang University in Seoul in 1994 when he was signed by the Los Angeles Dodgers as an amateur free agent. He would make his MLB debut 
for the Dodgers on April 8th, 1994, becoming the first South Korean player to play in the major leagues. Park would play parts of 17 seasons in the majors. His breakout season would come in 1996 at the age of 24 when he posted a 3.38 ERA over 32 starts and 192 innings pitched. That's pretty damn good. Yeah. At the end of Park's career, I mean, I remember Park coming into the league. Especially and, in the 90s. You oh, know, yeah. Like, great stuff. He was, high ERA time. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of Park's career, he would return to South Korea and make his KBO debut at the age of 39 to pitch one last year in front of his home country fans for the Hanwha Eagles. It was not a great swan song for the South Korean legend as he got lit up for a tune or to the tune of 5.06 ERA in 23 starts and 121 innings pitched. But on that 2012 Eagles team was a 25 year old pitcher by the name of Hun Jin Ryu. Ryu. Ah, I know him. Yes. He would follow in Park's footsteps at sign with the Dodgers that offseason and put up a three flat ERA in his first MLB season at the age of 26, carrying the torch forward that Park had lit. There have been 27 total players from Korea to play in Major League Baseball. And that number is soon to go up with the Giants edition of Jung Hoo Lee, who will most likely make his debut in 2024, barring injury or mm. terrible tragedy that we'll cover on this podcast. Mm. If that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Korean baseball fans are some of the best in the world, and the KBO continues to be an exciting, talent-filled professional league to this day. We now know that this is partially because a murdering anti-democratic leader who wanted to distract his population and the world from his heinous crimes and anti-democratic crackdown. Wow, Sean, that is an amazing story. I mean, I was always uh, intrigued by the Korean baseball league or organization, Yeah, but uh, fuck, man, I had no <laughs> idea that it was like, you know, Thousands died to yes, form that yes, league. Yes. <laughs> you know, I thought it was just an innocent little baseball league over across the Pacific Ocean. But boy, was I wrong. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I wonder now if the sword is oh a slight distraction <laughs> from their history. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, it's really cool that something so awesome, like, came from it. But Maybe the sword is a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, no, honestly, I, you know, just sitting there looking for uh, subjects for the next year, I just started looking into scandals in Japanese and, and, uh, and Korean baseball, and it's just like, what do you mean the dictator president made the league and <laughs> just mm -hmm. kind of went down a rabbit hole ended up reading a whole bunch of uh you know more uh academic papers than uh than than just like newspaper articles for yeah. this one That's amazing. uh yeah and it's just it was cool to kind of see and i definitely you know korea is just you know i i want to go you know i want to go to japan i want to go of course i want to go travel and go all these places but now just knowing the history of it all it kind of makes the like subculture of it just kind of have a little bit more context and also gives you just like oh kind of like holy shit like kind of moment of just like how things are formed throughout mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. it's never it's never as you say there's a lot of nuance to everything yeah yeah well that's amazing i i you know as you know i was in asia to go to vietnam yeah. a year and a half ago and that's we had a is. stopover in korea for not long enough to to venture out to the city and and yeah. see a game but if i had have done that i i would have been completely blind <laughs> to to the to that history so i really appreciate you enlightening me yeah. on that not yeah. that that really changes my my uh yeah, this my is the willingness to go to a game but 
You know, I'll <laughs> definitely right. have that in the back of my mind a little bit. Oh, I will understand why they're cheering yeah. so aggressively the entire game. Yeah, this is like a, <laughs> like a. I'm trying to think of the person. I just for some reason I'm just thinking of like Kennesaw Mountain Landis. It's like it's like the equivalent of like that man being like, oh, he killed a bunch of people and really wanted everyone to just watch baseball instead. <laughs> like there's just like this like absolutely like wait what. I could picture someone with a name like Kennesaw Mountain Landis being very authoritarian. <laughs> being a dictator. Yeah, being, yeah. I'm sure. I'm Spinning sure. a gun on his finger. I'm sure we'll do that in a threatening manner. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll be like, wow, I didn't know Kennesaw <laughs> took over a small island in Polynesia yeah. and sent everybody to re-education camps. <laughs> I'm just going to confirm that that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> well, until next time, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for joining us. Give us a listen. Or give us a listen. Give us a review. Give us a rating on however you're listening to us and where can they find us Edzie? Uh, they can find us on Twitter and the x.com machine at doing baseball and on Instagram at doing dot baseball and TikTok at doing dot baseball and I'm at Ed's do baseball I'm at Sean do baseball and uh, give us a follow give us a review excited for another year of baseball history let us know if you have an idea or a story subject you'd like us to cover and until next time I'm Sean and I'm Ed's and we were bringing you the baseball okay bye